think it's a great idea. <laughs> so today, I thought with Yom Kippur coming, that I would focus a little bit on the story of Jonah. I know some of you know the story, some of you don't. I'll do just a little summary of it. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But what I really want to talk about is why we read the story of Jonah on Yom Kippur and what does it mean for you and I. I believe that the story of Jonah is still taking place today, and I'm going to explain why. So let's go into the biblical story of Jonah. We read this story in the afternoon service of Yom Kippur. And it's this very moving and fantastic tale. There's a prophet. His name is Jonah. He's living in the year around 700 BCE. And this man, this prophet, not just a, a, an ordinary man, a prophet already puts him in a different category. He is determined to run from God. God calls on him to travel from Jerusalem to the Assyrian capital of Nineveh. The point of the travel is to influence the large population to repent and to let go of their know, immoral or corrupt ways. That was the point of the travel. What does he actually do? Remember, he's determined to run from God. So instead of going to Nineveh, he goes to the old port city of Jaffa. For those of you who have been to Israel, you know it's right near Tel Aviv. There's a little port city, right, literally adjacent to Tel Aviv. And he boards a ship that is going to Tunisia, to Africa. And he thinks it's such a, an elementary way of looking at the world, but he thinks he's running away from, from God's wish. <laughs> so the, the uh, I want to just bring it up here. Let me just see if I can get the verse here. Ah, here. Because uh, this is really what I want to talk about. So he, he boards the ship to Tunisia. Then God casts a mighty wind towards the sea. This is what the, this is exactly as it's written in the in the in the book of Jonah. I'm just reading it here. And there was a great tempest in the sea, so the ship seemed likely to be wrecked. So essentially, the ship is going to be capsized. Jonah accepted upon himself the blame for the storm that threatened the lives of all the people on the boat because he had run away from God. So what does Jonah say? Leave him. He says, leave me at sea, and the sea will come down from upon you. For I know, he says, that it's because of me that this great tempest is upon you. And so the story continues. They lifted Jonah and heaved him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then Jonah is swallowed by a large fish, and he remains in the fish for three days. Finally, at the end of the story, Jonah takes on his divine mission. He listens to God, and he does travel to the Assyrian capital. He does travel to Nineveh, and he causes a moral transformation in the hearts of the people. There is an evil civilization, and this evil civilization. Uh, redefines its life and redefines its relationships. But when Jonah discovers that God had accepted the population's repentance and decides not to destroy the city, he's grieved. And God proceeds to, to demonstrate to Jonah in a rather creative way what his, his error so I want to talk about this story. That's that's the story in a nutshell. Why do we read this on Yom Kippur? And even more important than Yom Kippur, what does it have to do with 2023? What does it have to do with me and you? What is the relevance of this ancient tale to our lives? I think one of the most fascinating elements about the Torah 
is that all of the stories in the Torah, in addition to their literal uh, concrete interpretation, also have a, a psychological interpretation. They have a spiritual interpretation. But, but every detail that's recorded in the Torah has some kind of allegorical or maybe uh, metaphorical interpretation. They, they symbolize an event that transpires continually within the human heart. The sages, over the course of 3,000 years, decoded the, the inner metaphysical meaning of most of the Torah stories. I mean, if you want to give a people that to piece apart, I mean, the Jewish people, we know how to turn everything and to, you know, somebody was talking about making chal earlier, we can knead that dough like nobody else. We can take any story and turn it into whatever we need. <clears throat> you know the the old story in the in the old country where in the state the guy can't find a place to tie up his horse. You know he's looking for a place to tie up his horse, so he says. Go, so some guy says, "Go to the rabbi; he can tie anything to anything." <laughs> so we know how to tie anything to anything, and so the story of Jonah and the fish. Aside, let's put aside the simple, the the literal me meaning of this story because. It has a literal meaning, and, and I don't want to take away from that. It, it takes place in a, in a particular location, in a particular time period. Um, it it's, has its own reason. But I think this should be viewed as a, as a metaphor. A metaphor for, for mental and for a spiritual story that's still happening today. I think the story of Jonah... And just lend me your, your metaphorical imagination for a moment. Actually refers to the entire lifespan of a human in this world. So let me explain it. The name Jonah in Hebrew is Yonah. Yonah is actually a dove. Think of like a turtle dove. The dove represents our inner soul. That that fragment of truth, that, that little piece of God that constitutes the core of human identity. The, the dove is the only animal that once it's, it encounters its mate, it remains forever loyal, never exchanging its mate for anyone else. The soul, the soul in, embodies that part of the human animal that may run, that may hide, but it never replaces the truth of God for the pleasures of the material world. We, The soul, though embodies a body, a physical body, it never, never separates from its true source, its source in the world of truth. What's Ninveh? This Assyrian capital city. It's a large, it's a powerful, it's a corrupt city. I think it's a metaphor for our world. Our world that's filled with petty politics, with vanity, with corruption. Jonah, who's a human soul, is asked by God, or even put on a mission, we talk about mission, we talk about purpose in this class a lot, is given a purpose. So Jonah's soul is given a purpose to revolutionize the earthly realm, to introduce the light of godliness, of spirituality, of holiness into every aspect of this physical world. The soul is the messenger that carries a message. The soul is a witness to the presence of a living God, of God in this world. But very often, we choose to run from our life's mission. We reject 
our identity as witnesses. We take a ship to Tunisia. We, what is that ship? That ship represents the body. The body that is the, the physical vessel for the human soul. Just like a ship has passengers. And the passengers on the ship, what are they doing? They're, they're escaping to a certain extent, physically, uh, emotionally. Maybe they're going to a place that can more easily embrace the illusion that we don't have a mission, that we don't have a purpose. Some people have said that we are no more than than creatures just trying to find uh, self-gratification. And we sail through the waters of life and often we ignore that inner voice. We ignore that intuition. We try to convince ourselves that we're happy. Everything seems fine. Most of the time, right? We we can we can kind of sail through life. I'm using the ship metaphor. <laughs> we can try. To, we can kind of sail through life, and everything seems fine for most of the time. But what happens every so often? And I'm sure I can relate to this. I, I hope you can as well. Every so often, there's turbulence. Something shakes up our lives. The turbulence of the sea, like the story of Jonah. What is that a metaphor for? It's a metaphor for the tumultuous circumstances that life presents us. Threatening the very survival of our ship, our body, our existence. All of a sudden, it kind of shakes us up. It wakes us up from our illusion. But there are some who precisely at these moments become even more detached from their authentic self, from, from their reality. The story goes that the, the sailors, the, the people on the ship, they become frightened. They, they cry out. Interestingly enough, it says that each one cries out to their God. Everyone's got a separate God. <laughs> you can go talk to your God. I'm going to go talk to my God. But what does Jonah do when everyone's crying and everyone's praying? He goes to sleep. Goes into the inner parts of the ship. He lays down and he falls asleep. I think that there's a piece of Jonah in every single one of us. It's, it's this, this person who sees the world turning over but just sleeps. It's that, that passive bystander. He makes believe that everything's okay, uh, whitewashes, uh, just kind of glosses over all of the difficulties of this world, saying, eh, it's all going to be good, it's okay, someone else will take care of it. And the greater the turmoil, the, the deeper the chaos, the more that soul sinks into the sleep, into the slumber, the more it becomes oblivious to the reality of the world and the plight of those around it. What happens at that point? What? Because we're not just a body. We're not just a ship. We are a soul that inhabits that ship. So what does the soul do? The soul is going to tickle the body. The soul, the soul is the, the shipmaster, the captain. Because what happens in the story of Jonah, the shipmaster approaches him and says, how can you sleep so soundly? Arise, call to your God. Call to your God. The soul wakes us up and says, what's going on? Wake up. There's a world out there. We're drowning. The shipmaster the captain of the body, I think represents the Yetzer Tov, the good inclination. 
the, the little spark of God that resides within the human soul. And the spark calls out to the soul and says, how can you sleep so soundly? How long, how long can you be in denial of your universe gone mad? How much longer are you going to make believe that you don't get it? The ship captain, the soul, it turns to, to the Jonah, to the, to the person and says, remember where you came from. Remember where your soul came from. Remember who you, who you are authentically. Remember from what people you are. Stop denying who you are. Don't run from your destiny. Your destiny is a witness to the voice at, at Sinai that's charging you with a mission, with a purpose, paving a road through the forest of history, through the jungle of history. Don't escape your purpose. Dig uncover the divine art in every aspect of your life. What happens at the end? What happens to Jonah? A strange and melancholy honesty takes over Jonah. His moral instinct finds this, this perverse expression and his suggestion to the sailors to throw him into the sea. He says to the others, this very strange request, rid yourself of the burden that is imposed by my existence. Today, in the world that's still dealing with COVID and the aftermaths of it. There's another pandemic going on, with the, pa the pandemic of mental health, of depression, of sadness, of, of loneliness. Depression is something that a lot of souls grapple with. It takes over the soul and it can never truly convince itself that God is non-existent. It, it causes this kind of turmoil. It's caught in a limbo. It, it's afraid to embrace God fully and it can't run from God. So what does the soul do? It says, just get rid of me, bury my soul. Just, I'm just gonna go and I'm gonna hide I don't need to live here. I don't need to be here. Uh, just, 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 just get rid of me. Throw me off the boat. I think about this a lot. I, I think about a lot of people who are who are dealing with this. It's like a, a surrender to the last vestige of spiritual dignity. It's allowing our soul to be swept away by the raging waters of lust or, or addiction. I think what's even worse is it's allowing the, the human identity to become swallowed and almost converted into an animal, into an amphibian creature. We don't see ourselves at this point as different from an animal. We just become that animal. Interesting is that the Hebrew word, they say it's a whale, right? Jonah and the whale. But actually, the, in the Hebrew word that's used in the story for the fish is daga. Daga, it's not necessarily a whale. It's, it's a large fish. But there's also another translation in Hebrew for the word daga. And that's anxiety. He's, he's thrown, think about it. He says, just throw me, throw me into the water. And what 
swallows him, his anxiety. Think about anxiety, how it swallows us. It, it represents this alternative emotional response to the turmoil of life. We throw ourselves into the to the world, into the water, into all the insanity. <laughs> I hear so many issues that are going on in people's lives, but they're first world problems. There's an extraordinary anxiety and stress that's involved with climbing the financial ladder, or the, the, the financial ladder, and it creates a certain anxiety. Oh my gosh, the guy sitting next to me on the plane is complaining about the Wi-Fi. When I get on a plane, my joy is finally I can disconnect for two or three or four hours on the plane. And he's complaining the Wi-Fi is not working. I want to turn to him and say, the Wi-Fi is not working. Where were you three years ago? It wasn't even a thought. Not, 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 not 20 years ago. Forget about 20 years ago. Three years ago, it was barely a thought. We become so swallowed up by our careers, by our life, that we almost forget that we're human. And I think, to a certain extent, this is the first time that our soul, at this moment, at this moment of anxiety, our soul cries out for the first time. What does Jonah say? From the belly of hell, I cried out. From the belly of hell. That's what it takes. The soul has to reach the belly of hell. It's busy running from God. It's busy denying its own reality. It's busy running from itself. And he reaches rock bottom. All of a sudden, that's when you discover the presence of a, of a loving and caring God. Why? Why does it always happen that people go running to, to the rabbi or, or running to God when it's rock bottom? Why do we have to get to that point? I think the soul, by its very nature, can never remain in one place. The soul always has to be in a state of movement. The only question is, in which direction is the soul moving? Is it running to God or is it running away from God? So once the soul hits rock bottom, it can't go any further down. It has to move upward. Once you hit rock bottom, you can't go anywhere else. You have to go the other way. And so at that point, the Jonah, the individual, the soul, rediscovers the truth. That the purpose, that, that the soul is here for a purpose. That the soul is here for a mission. And what happens? Anxiety. The, the anxiety spits the soul out. The fish spits the soul out. The person then goes for recovery to AA, to, to they, they abandon the addiction, they, they, they abandon whatever is making them anxious. And now the soul can embark on a journey to make a difference in people's lives, to bring holiness, to bring godliness into their own life, as well as the life of a mundane, of a narcissistic, of an egocentric society. But that at that point, the soul becomes distressed over God's loyalty to our world. You see, once the soul discovers the truth of godliness, it wants to just become godly. It wants to remain in the sacred environment. It wants to be removed from from the filth. Why do I have to deal with this profane ugliness? Am I supposed to dedicate 
the remainder of my life to understand the the pettiness of of small beings of of polit the politics oh the politics. Why do I have to deal with all this stuff? It's it's yuck. It's schmutz. I think that it's it's from this that the predictable pattern becomes. After after the soul discovers God's living presence, it it craves to become part of God. It wants to escape the the confines of this lowly universe and, and melt away in the in infinity. And then God, and going back to the metaphor, God, God reveals to Jonah, to the soul, that by infusing the unholy with the holy, that is the point of living in this world. The point of living in this world is to bring heaven down to earth, is to bring holiness into this world. That it's only in the schmutz, it's only in the muck of planet earth, that you can bring holiness, true holiness. So the soul, despite its its natural resistance, it has to learn to emulate God. It has to learn to embrace the world and not to escape it. So I ask my final question before we go on to your reflections, your thoughts, your questions. Why do we read this on Yom Kippur, this, this beautiful story? I think there are two types of human sleepers. There are those who find themselves in a lighter sleep, who, with a gush of inspiration, with a little bit of turbulence, they're going to wake up. And there are those who are so submerged in their slumber that even the most powerful explosion in the metaphor won't budge them. So the first category of people what happens? Comes Rosh Hashanah. They wake up from the sound of the shofar. All of a sudden, they hear the shofar, this, this primitive, uh, piercing sound of a ram's horn. This sound that stems from a, a simple, primitive depth of the human core. And it inspires them to wake up and to realize what life is all about. But then there are people who sleep. Who sleep through everything. They sleep through the sound of the shofar. <laughs> The ship is about to break. It's going to capsize, and they're sleeping. The the Titanic is about to go under, and they're stretched out in their first-class deck chair, smoking a cigar, oblivious to what's about to happen. September 11th that we just passed, massacres in Israel, the, the worst bloodshed in modern history, the Holocaust, they're sleeping. Children are are being exploited. And and a world, the world does nothing. They're busy playing a game of vanity. The the shofar is sounding, but nobody hears it. They can hear it a hundred times, like we we, we blow it in the the synagogue a hundred times. But they just, what is it? It's like a, a, a snooze button. You know, you hear the alarm clock going, but you keep on pressing the snooze. Then comes Yom Kippur. What is Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur is a day that tolerates no cover-ups. It's a day that does not tolerate anything that's inauthentic. It doesn't tolerate any facade. It's not just the holiest day of the calendar. It's the day that all the veils are lifted. That we can actually look within ourselves, as difficult as it is, and we can see the truth. We can break through all the walls, all the barriers, and we can even touch those who have tucked themselves away under a myriad of blankets. On Yom Kippur, we reach the, the innermost depth of our soul. We The soul that, that is, is sleeping no matter what we do. And that's the moment of true change. And that's the moment where the captain 
where the shipmaster says, how can you sound so sleepy? Arise, call to your God. And that is the essence of Yom Kippur. That's what it's all about.